I was really taken when Tom was talking earlier about those empty moments in your day when you start to really consider things. So this morning when I was ironing my trousers, I must admit I thought, why the hell do I want these creases down the front of my trousers? What is it that's driving me to try and have pencil straight creases down the front of these trousers because of you? I was thinking, what am I doing? Where, where's that urge come from? And then I wanted to know the history of that. Can't have been Greeks and Romans because they didn't wear trousers. So which person decided this was an essential to being you know, acceptable, neat, uh, whatever it is, a bit like the tie? But all these things define us and we don't ask enough questions. We don't ask ourselves, well, why? why? Why don't we change that? And I think that's the real key that I want to get to. Why don't we uh, accept that we, we talk about change, we, we want to inspire change, and yet for some reason we fight against some of those changes almost unthinkingly. I ironed my trousers. Unthinkingly thought that's the way to do them rather than just you know, put on the trousers. So that got me thinking about, well, this school, I wanted to give you a snapshot of this school but the progressive education movement because I think it still has a great deal to teach the education movement uh, broadly. So Frencham uh, began 1925, pacifist, co-educational, non-religious, uh, cooperation rather than coercion, uh, all subjects treated as equal and uh, a sense of uh, generosity of spirit is what the founders talked about. And those same tenets, I think, carry through right through to today. We try and live by those, many, uh, those same sorts of things. Of course, the schools meandered over those 90-plus years, but, but generally those are the things we still talk about. And if you think of the end of World War I when it was established, they really were trying to say, we don't want a school that produces young men and women who end up going to the trenches and, and suffer that terrible uh, fate. It was also a World War I hospital, ironically, at the time of that war. And they really were challenging. They were really trying to challenge education in the 1920s. They were really trying to say, this doesn't feel right. We want something different. We want something that doesn't produce unquestioning obedience in those situations. And at that time, this sort of movement was seen as completely uh, idiotic, frankly. You know, there was a very small number of schools. And those that have survived have really tried to continue to enunciate, if you like, that message that there is more to education than just the straight rows and the hands in the air and the obedience and all of those sorts of things that still exist in so many schools today. So progressive education, I think, still has a really important impact and an opportunity. I regularly go to meetings, and I went to a meeting of those same pinstriped, middle-aged, mostly men uh, who run other schools just last year, and it was sort of shocking, actually, because on the agenda was girls in trousers. And uh, I, I was strangely hosting it and looked at this item and said, look, not my concern, fellas, over to you. What do you want to discuss? And one of the heads said, well, I have a real problem with girls wearing trousers in my school. Oh, OK. Um, OK, the conversation kept going. And another man said, um, well, we, we control the uniform in my school. So if a girl asks to wear trousers, we put them in boys' trousers so they're so uncomfortable they want to go back into a skirt. And I actually said, sorry, can we, can we stop this conversation? I'm finding this a bit uncomfortable. And then another headmaster said, well, I find it aesthetically unpleasing, a young woman in, a tr in trousers. Hi. And I, I said at that point, I'm sorry, I'm either going to have to leave or I'm going to lose you as my friends because you can't say this stuff. Have you not been reading the papers recently? Have you not aware of the world out there? And one of them said, in all honesty, you forget, Andrew, we operate in the 1950s and you operate in the 2020s. And I, I must admit, I looked at him and said, but you're a leader, aren't you? So don't change that. Do something about it rather than just accept it and promulgate it, continue it. Um, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't a happy ending to that particular meeting because they weren't willing to shift their perception. So progressive education has to keep teaching that. I really find it bizarre, actually, that we still have debates in the media just a, two or three weeks ago about uniforms. What is it about the British colonial system that insists that uniform is a way to educate. Most of the world doesn't wear uniform, and yet we get fixated about it. I used to shout at children because their tie wasn't done up or their trousers weren't the right length. There's a school not far from here that says you can't wear shoes with Velcro, and they have to be a particular make. And I just get so frustrated that we lose sight of what's happening inside that uniform and get fixated on the outer wrappings. 
So a school like mine has to keep challenging people and say it's nothing to do with your dress. Self-discipline, self-management, self-image, uh, ego are all driven by other things than whether your tie is done up or not. Something that I failed to achieve, I've been teaching since the, since the mid-80s, but I've continued to fail to wipe it out, but I wish I had succeeded, is homework. In my second year of teaching, about 1986, I was on a working party looking into homework in a big boy school where if you didn't play rugby or row, you sort of didn't exist. And we as a group of young teachers decided that homework wasn't achieving anything and put this to the senior management. And you could have almost heard the speed with which it was ejected into the bin uh, and never acted upon. And continuously throughout my whole career, I've tried to get people to question the validity of homework, particularly in an environment like this. There are always schools that will require uniform, actually, for uniformity and security of children and not defining wealth. I get that totally. But in this sort of environment, where we're so lucky and we're so resourced, I question the validity of homework. Homework was important when schools were working with illiterate children who needed time to learn to read, or, or in the uh, industrial age, when a lot of the models that we take still today to be the norm for education were started. But I'm not sure homework really takes us anywhere. The stress that it adds to that child, the challenge that it adds to that family environment, the exhaustion of that child. You know, I work really hard, I do long days, but I get to a point where I've had enough and I don't sit down at my kitchen table and try and do meaningful work. So long have I accepted bits of Shakespeare text or, or homework that is enough to get out of trouble that doesn't indicate any learning and I'm an English teacher, but that was the norm. You know, I, OK, I, here, Mr Fisher, thank you. You know, phew, got away, no homework. Nothing learned, but that was what I was conditioned to do. Why aren't we challenging that mentality in the 2020s? Why aren't we saying these kids have learned enough, possibly, or there are other ways they could use that time in the evenings rather than doing homework? The other thing that I really think we need to challenge is the whole politicising of education. So much of education is driven by assessments and driven by data, and they both have a place. But I'm not convinced, and I've been doing this a heck of a long time, that I learnt something different about a child over a, a four-year period that I didn't really have a good handle on within the first six to eight months by annually assessing that child. If you think of all the children in this country, they are being assessed from the age of four to the age of 18 constantly absolutely constantly, then they go to university when they're being assessed in another way, and then a lot of us are assessed during our working lives and we sort of accept it as a, as a norm. And I wish we wouldn't, particularly in the young, because those assessments all lead to anxiety, all lead to a sense of stress. And I'm not sure we as teachers are asking for that assessment, but I think politics is asking for that assessment and that data so that the education secretary can spout statistics and we all think, gosh, you're doing a good job. You've improved the attainment by 0.4% over the last 12 months. Of what? You ask any really good teacher, they will have a handle on a child and they will know that child from their daily experiences of monitoring and conversation and, and engagement and assessing their work without necessarily having to call it an assessment. So why do we impose this? Funnily enough, I think it's because there's a fundamental annoyance that teachers get summer holidays. It's absolutely true. I think it drives so much of the polit politics. They're basically annoyed. How dare you have six weeks off and we don't? Well, politics, they do actually, strangely, but <laughs> there's this sort of jealousy and anger and, and expectation that teachers are therefore lazy and they're not very good. And how can we possibly trust them to make these judgments just because they're professionals and they've been working for 20 years and they've got a degree and they've known 10,000 children in their career? Can't be good enough. We need some data to challenge them, to show their value added. I've added more value to children around a campfire or on a high ropes course or in the Central African experiences I've done than I've ever added in my English teaching. And I was a really good English teacher. So I question why this, this political drive is allowed to dominate education generally. You know, why we as parents and, and students and, and knowledgeable, educated adults don't say, you know what, you keep getting this wrong. Let's <laughs> leave it to some teachers 
Let's put an organisation in place that does lead education, who actually does education, rather than a, a, a lawyer who's become a politician or a business leader who's become a politician. And I've lived in England 24 years, nearly 25 years. I've been a headmaster here for nearly 15 years. And the amount of change in, in that 25 years is just ridiculous, actually. Just ridiculous. And has it really led to change, positive outcomes? No, I really don't think so. I look at the amount of stress that young people experience, the, the shocking level of mental health um, issues, and, and the system doesn't change. Why not? I don't know. I don't know why we're not allowed to say, you know what's not good for society, to producing young people who suffer. Sorry. Um. And deny it, and then, and then blame them for it. It's the other utterly bizarre thing. We say, well, I, I didn't have that when I was a boy. Oh, I mean, what's wrong with you? Oh, it must be screen time. It must be this. It must be that. How many of us actually stop and look back and think what we were like at 14 or 15? You know, I was lost. I was 15. I didn't know who I wanted to be at all. Why do we somehow assume that competition and assessment and data will make our 15-year-olds of today any different to us? I don't really understand that. And we've lost that, that sense of time and humanity, as we've been talking about all day, actually. That sense of time when young people could just stop. That sense of time when young people could dream and think and imagine. That sense of time when they can climb a tree that sense of time when they could go home without another hour and a half of homework to do and kick a football or have a cup of tea or actually just chat to their parents. We've taken that away and we're somehow surprised that, social, uh, that children are suffering and we're somehow sort of putting the blame on them for not being as robust as us. Nothing drives me more mad than, than a politician saying we now need to teach resilience. We need to teach grit. Grit? Gosh, I... <laughs> How do you teach grit? Do you want to teach grit? I'm not sure I do, actually. And I see resilience all the time in young people because they're surviving their system, because they are actually getting through their system, because they are making a difference. I see grit all the time in young people who dig in when all that pressure, all that expectation, all that constant assessment, all that supplying of data that goes into some data void that we somehow have to obey. And I see it and I see it and I see it without it being taught as a skill um, because that occurs to one of our secretaries of state for education. So I think there's still a really lot to be challenged through progressive education. The other layer that I think is really sad at the moment is the pressure that the parents are feeling for a perfect outcome. And parents really do feel this, and I'm not at all critical of them because many of them have grown up through that system. But so many parents are fearful that their children won't somehow get through that system. Or so many parents are fearful that they have to provide a certainty. And we all know life isn't certain, but we feel we have to provide a certainty. I find it really sad when I watch particularly young parents who ask their children endless questions just make the decision. They're only tiny. I was in this pool here at school and there was a young mum with a little child on the side going, do you want to get in? 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 Come on, let's get in. Do you want to get in? And I just went, just bring them in. <laughs> just pick them up. Bring them in the pool. And the next thing was, do you want to get out? Should we get out? Are you cold? Do you want to get out? Do you want to get... So there's a point where little children need you to be the adult and protect them. But equally, there's a point where bigger children need you to be adults and protect them. I was at a prep school where a father said, I'm really worried that my daughter won't get into her preferred school in London because she's only got a brown belt in karate. <laughs> and, and I laughed, I scoffed and said, how old, sorry, how old's your daughter? She's 10. I said, what's she going to do with the rest of her life if she's a karate black belt by 12? <laughs> when is that good enough? If, if being a brown belt at 10 isn't good enough? She, <laughs> wow. And there's all this pressure on these parents from, again, the same system of assessment and data and, and endless competition. Here, we don't use competition. We use it as little as we can. And a lot of children love competitive games. They love that sense of competition. But keep it in perspective. 
It doesn't matter if you win or lose, frankly. If you're not, you know, one percent of us will be footballers for England or, or actors on the West End. Ninety-nine percent of us just need to enjoy ourselves and to enjoy those experiences without being constantly told we're failing because we can't compete. I used to coach rowing in Australia to the second boys eight, the best athletes I've ever come across. They would lose the head of the river and never row again. They were exceptional athletes, but they'd failed because they hadn't won that one race in their whole school career. To oppose that, just briefly, and I haven't even looked at my own clock, so I'd better watch time. Uh, the best football, sorry, uh, sporting coaching I've ever done, I'm not a great coach. Uh, I had to coach the seventh boys rugby team one year, and they were all the boys that had trialled for the top two teams, not made it, and weren't willing to play for any other team. So we were called the social sevenths. And they were undefeated, but the best thing was they were great cheats. Uh, they were good, talented rugby players. We didn't train, we laughed, we, we chatted. Some of them would be you know, hung over from the Friday before. They were 17, 18. They'd turn up and they'd play great rugby. Uh, and we, none of us had ever beaten this school called St Joseph's College, who were superb. I know, sorry, I haven't got to the end, but I'd better get there. Who were superb. And so they kicked a penalty goal. My team kicked a penalty goal in the first minute and then cheated for the rest of the game, which was superb because it infuriated the Joey's parents so much and they cheated with such skill and humour that the poor little ref couldn't do anything about it and we, weren't under, we, we finally beat Joey's in that final bit. So I want to finish with the positives. Despite all that negative, despite all that worry about parenting and data and assessments, I'm entirely inspired by the brightness of the opportunities that these young people then do show. I meet young people all the time who want to change the world, who want to change the ecology, who are much more socially conscious than I ever was at that age, who are much more equality in a global sense conscious than I ever was at that age. Actually, this, this generation coming through really, really are stunning young people because they've survived all of that. They've shown the resilience we expect them to have. They've shown the grit that we somehow have to teach them. And they come out the other end. Incredible, incredible young people far superior than I ever was at 17 or 18, far, far superior to that. So actually I hope we can strip out some of the damage that we do through this whole system and allow more people to achieve at that level and not be bowed down by anxiety attacks, not be bowed down by feeling of failure and not be drawn into having to wait longer for that feeling of success. And it is schools like this that I think give that opportunity more than others. Uh, because we don't live by the trappings and the pressures of other schools. We're lucky, we're blessed, we don't have to. And it's been a thrill to run it and to be involved with it. But fundamentally, I think society is losing sight of childhood and the importance of it.